This is Focus on Your Health. It's brought to you by Kingman Regional Medical Center in historic Kingman, Arizona. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and my guest this week is Dr. Lucy Kalamathy. She's an internist and clinical instructor at Stanford School of Medicine. Her late husband, Dr. Paul Kalanithi, was a neurosurgeon at Stanford. He was also a gifted writer. His book, When Breath Becomes Air, recounts his path in medicine and his battle with the lung cancer that claimed his life when he was just 37 years old. Dr. Lucy Kalanithi, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Um, I'm excited to talk about the book, about Paul's work and your work. But first, we should say that you've given a number of interviews lately for TV and radio. And this one is singular, I think, because we are recording in Paul's hometown, the place he grew up, Kingman, Arizona. That's right. It's been so great to be here. I mean, obviously, I've been here many times and for multiple Christmases. Um, and Paul's parents, uh, Dr. Paul and Sue Kalanithi, live here. So um, we know a lot of people in the town. But it's really fun to be back to celebrate Paul's book, um, you know, and help remember him and then connect with a lot of people. It's been such a warm welcome. Yeah, I've met more people in the community on this trip than ever before. So it's actually been a really rich part of my Kingman experience even though Paul's not here, um, I'm continuing to get to love Kingman. I'm glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. That makes me happy. Um, you and Paul met when you were, was it just when you were med students at Stanford? That's right. We actually went to Yale for medical school, and we met in 2003 when we were first-year students. And so you crossed the country, came back out west. Yeah. Um, we we fell in love in our first year, like I said, Um at first, I knew he was smart, but I didn't realize how funny he was, and that was actually the thing that drew me to him. Mm -hmm. And we got married a few years later when we were fourth-year students. That's the last year of med school. And then we packed a car and actually came through Kingman at that time uh, yeah. and moved to California to be at Stanford. Right. Everybody passes through Kingman. <laughs> That's right. And at Stanford, you were you know, in, involved in your residencies, working crazy hours, probably not seeing a whole lot of each other, I imagine, right? A lot of coming and going. Yeah, it's pretty nutty. I actually started out, I trained in a different hospital at UCSF. Okay. Um, and so that made it even harder to see each other. And both of us were working upwards of 80 hours a week. And then um, my residency went for three years and Paul's was seven years. Oh and gosh. in the sixth year of his residency, which was 2013, um, that was when he was diagnosed with cancer. Right. And we're talking about his book, When Breath Becomes Air. And there's a prologue. And then after that, kind of two parts. One is the more or less the professional or the early years and in, into the professional tract. And then after that is, you know, his his life with cancer, uh, the last couple of years of his life. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, he was what, 35 when he was diagnosed with cancer? He was, so he was 36. He had just turned 36 when he was diagnosed okay. and he died just before he turned 38. Right. Um, so he, he was alive for 22 months after having been diagnosed. Um, and you're right. The book is kind of divided into two halves. The first half, he's a doctor working as a neurosurgeon and then it kind of flips. And the second half is about being a patient. Yeah. And this is really one of those underlying themes. Well, we should say uh, lung cancer and, and Paul never smoked a day in his life. That's right. That's right. There's an interesting passage he says here in the book uh, that uh, only 0.0012% hmm. of 36-year-olds get lung cancer. And then later he adds, it occurred to me that my relationship with statistics changed as soon as I became one. Right. You know, you talk about life as a doctor and then life as a patient. And it seems to me that's really one of the strong features of the book is this question of where, I mean, you guys are physicians. And so when they're using, when the doctors are in the, in the room, his oncologist is in the room and she's using the, the medical language, you know exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you understood the, the severity of the diagnosis. Right, right. One of the things that Paul's kind of exploring uh, in the book and kind of which he explored throughout his life was kind of the question of how to make a meaningful life and then how to build our values in our lives, um, you know, and live out our lives despite the fact that we're all mortal and we know that we're going to die. We often avoid that fact and thinking about that fact. Um, but part of the reason he went into medicine was to grapple with that and help people face that. And then suddenly, like you describe, we're on the other side. We're the patient and his wife and we're looking right at um, a serious illness. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 really intense, as I'm sure a lot of listeners know. 
the book has just been out was the beginning of January. It was released. So it's been just over a month, five weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of great reviews, a lot of, um, discussion growing out of that. Yeah. And, and maybe this is an obvious question, but why do you suppose it's so compelling to people? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, it's funny because, um, you know, Paul died when he was finishing the book. And then over the past year, I've been working with the editor to make sure it happened, you know, yeah. got published. Yeah. And we asked ourselves, will people want to read a book about dying by a young man who recently died? It's a it's a good question. And then since it got published in January, it's been number one on the New York Times bestseller list for five weeks. And um, I agree. It's a. I think it's a real indication that people are interested in talking about illness and death and meaning, um, and kind of all those those questions that the book brings up some really serious questions. Um, but it's you know it's not just about dying. It's about living, and it kind of shows me too that people are hungry for exactly what you're describing, like like real conversations about these yeah. these big issues in our lives because they happen to all of us. Yeah, and he uh, there's a point where he describes. Uh, no, excuse me. I guess that's in in your um, and in your epilogue where you're saying it's a death avoidant culture or something right. to that that term. Like we we look the other way. It is a cycle of life that we will all approach, and yet we'd rather we'd rather not think about that stuff. Right. It's interesting because the I agree, and the title of the book "When Breath Becomes Air" comes from a poem. Um, it, that starts out by saying, you that seek what life is in death, now find it air that once was breath. And even the title of the book kind of socks you in the gut, you know, like, whoa, when yeah. breath becomes air, it talks about that moment of dying. And and it is really intense, and, and we often do look away from it. That's right. Yeah. Paul had, he had a lot of interests. I mean, you touched on literature. Surgeons have a reputation of being sort of type A personalities. Um, and, you know, looking at his resume, it's clear he was an achiever of the highest order. And yet, he, his voice in the book, he comes across as gentle, as wise, far beyond his years. Um, part of that certainly because of his extensive education, but I think a significant part of it is just what he was going through and, and this time of illness and reflection. Um, what am I getting to? I feel like, fair or not, surgeons get this reputation of being... Uh, uh, aggressive and uh, kind of know-it-alls and Paul comes across in such a gentle way yeah um, uh, it's funny because you know being in Kingman this week people have been reiterating to me you know stories of their own interactions with Paul um, being a funny person or being a kind person it's been great to hear and uh, you're right he, he doesn't fit the total typical mold of a surgeon but he um, he was really proud to be a surgeon and he really did want to connect with people in that role. Mm -hmm. Um, and interestingly, like even as he went through his education, um, he did study English literature, like you alluded to, and then he went to medical school and it was kind of about, um, wanting to kind of explore what it means to be human and build relationships with people. And so that kind of softness or gentleness, um, was like something that actually was guiding him through his intense education because he was seeking, you know, to serve people and to get to know people. And then later it turned into, he did that as a surgeon. Yeah. I'm imagining that his background in, in literature really informed and enriched those, those years and those interactions with people. Right, right. And he always thought he'd be a writer. He never thought about being a doctor. His dad, um, Dr. Paul Kalanithi, is a cardiologist in Kingman, as I'm sure people know. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul himself wanted to go study stories and how um, literature and stories make us understand what it is to be human. And then finally he thought, you know what, actually the medical setting is where a lot of stories happen in people's lives. And so to him, they were kind of literature and medicine were kind of connected, which doesn't seem totally obvious at, you know, when you first see it, but for him, that was the case. I found that delightful about him, in fact, where he's, he's a young man saying, I know for sure I won't be a doctor. Right. I mean, he, his father's a physician, his uncle and his brother, both physicians, right? He didn't know at the time, but his future wife would be a physician as well. Um, and he's just interested in stories. And um, I think that's lovely for a lot of reasons. And, and one is, you know, um, it just goes against that common wisdom or that common approach that, uh, okay, kids, go out there and get an education so you can get a job, so you can make good money, so you don't have to worry. He's just 
sort of reveling in literature. I think it's pretty amazing about mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. He really did revel in literature. He, um, it's funny because we just talked about that progression where Paul was a young guy who thought he would be a writer and a reader and then became a surgeon. Interestingly, as soon as he himself got diagnosed with cancer, he turned right back into a reader. Um, he, you know, on the day that we got this terrible news of a chest x-ray that looked really worrisome, and both of us being doctors, we thought, oh my gosh, I, I think this is cancer. I was packing for the hospital, and I was packing things like socks and phone chargers and other things you need to be comfy in your hospital room, you know, pillows. And Paul just packed three books to take to the hospital. <laughs> he, he packed um, Heidegger's Being and Time, and he packed Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis and uh, a book by Solzhenitsyn called Cancer Ward. And so he was kind of putting together you know, philosophy and religion and literature about cancer. And he just, he, it was sort of like, this is the worst moment of my life. This is the pivotal moment of my life. I know I'm going to get diagnosed with cancer and I need to take books. So, you know, that, that love of reading actually served him well. He read, he read a lot of poetry and, um, uh, he, he said as he was sick, uh, poetry is more comforting to me than even scripture. Um, so he just felt so connected through words. And I think that's what led him to write the book, When Breath Becomes Air. We'll step aside, and we'll be back in just a moment for more with Dr. Lucy Kalanithi. But first, the sounds of Arizona. Here is Calexico to play us to the break with a sample of the audiobook of When Breath Becomes Air from Penguin Random House Audio. The actor is Sunil Malhotra. This is Focus on Your Health. Stick around. From my desert plateau, I could see our house just beyond the city limits at the base of the Surbat Mountains amid red rock deserts speckled with mesquite tumbleweeds, and paddle-shaped cacti. Out here, dust devils swirled up from nothing, blurring your vision, then disappeared. Spaces stretched on, then fell away into the distance. Our two dogs, Max and Nip, never grew tired of the freedom. Every day, they'd venture forth and bring home some new desert treasure. The leg of a deer, unfinished bits of jackrabbit to eat later the sun-bleached skull of a horse, the jawbone of a coyote. My friends and I loved the freedom too, and we spent our afternoons exploring, walking, scavenging for bones and rare desert creeks. Having spent my previous years in a lightly forested suburb in the northeast with a tree-lined main street and a candy store, I found the wild, windy desert alien and alluring. When I was 10, my father had moved us, three boys, ages 14, 10, and 8, from Bronxville, New York, a compact affluent suburb just north of Manhattan, to Kingman, Arizona, in a desert valley ringed by two mountain ranges, known primarily to the outside world as a place to get gas en route to somewhere else. He was drawn by the sun, by the cost of living, How else would he pay for his sons to attend the colleges he aspired to? And by the opportunity to establish a regional cardiology practice of his own. His unyielding dedication to his patients soon made him a respected member of the community. And welcome back to Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week my guest is Dr. Lucy Kalanithi. She's an internist and clinical instructor at Stanford School of Medicine. Her late husband, Dr. Paul Kalanithi, was a neurosurgeon at Stanford. His book, When Breath Becomes Air, recounts his life in medicine, literature, and Kingman, Arizona. And it's a New York Times bestseller.
So I, I'm wondering, maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but you know, reading this and I was thinking about not just the shame that, that we lost Paul's medical excellence, um, but his literary voice. I mean, he's, he's a fine writer, a fine stylist. And I started thinking, maybe we didn't. Maybe there, uh, there are reams of other written material at home, and I wonder if you'll let me in on that secret. Oh, that's a fun, yeah, we actually, he was writing all the time and even, even emails, honestly, he wrote all these long emails to his best friend and yeah. I quote one of them in the epilogue to the book and he had these really funny travelogues that he would write these journals while on a trip to India. Um, we were just thinking, you know, maybe we'll make an April Fool's joke where you know, we somehow put out some of that extra writing and say, here's the sequel to When Breath Becomes <laughs> Air. Because it's true, we have all this, he, yeah. I have a lot of his beautiful writing. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, you know, nothing to do with the book. I mean, I wonder if there'll be some opportunity for that to see the light of day. That's a great question. Like I haven't an, been asked that, actually, but that's a good question. This is what I'm thinking like an editor, but. Sure. Like, um, what's the term, an epistolary, like a, a collection of that's letters. That's right. That's right. Um, yeah. There's this voice there, and and it's he makes good company. And I think, you know, when we're you talk about leaning on literature in those dark times, and, and I think that's probably the greatest role of an artist is is company. When you're up against this existential void, when you're feeling lonely and empty, and you're not sure what happens next. I mean, that's isn't art just the great comfort for that? Right, right. And even since Paul died, I've sort of really felt that. Um, yeah. I was reading A Grief Observed by C.S. Lewis, which has this amazing quote. I'm just kind of responding to what you said about literature being so comforting. It has this amazing quote that says something like, um, uh, bereavement is not the truncation of married love, but one of its regular phases. And what we want is to live our marriage well and faithfully through that time too. And those are sentences that C.S. Lewis wrote about losing his beloved wife, wife also to cancer. But it's this amazing thing that he puts into words where I was thinking, you know, I feel so lonely and I miss Paul, but I still love Paul and I'm still doing things for Paul, you know, like helping finish this book. And, um, it is amazing when someone else puts something into words that you didn't even know you felt or could, you know, it's it's just, it does make you feel less alone and much more comforted. I thought that was really striking in what you wrote at the end of the book, um, saying that you're, you're still living out the plans the two of you made. And, you know, gosh, reading that, I, I thought, initially I thought, does not compute. How, how could this be, right? Um, but it's very sweet. It's, it's I, I think I get it as much as I could, you know? Yeah, I think it's funny. I mean, first of all, we have a daughter. We decided to have a daughter when Paul was sick. And so um, she's now 19 months old. Her name's Katie. And so raising her obviously feels like a promise kept to Paul. And I think it probably always will. Um, you know, and she's this little sweet kid with dark eyes and dark hair and I have blue eyes and light hair. And so even just looking at her, she looks like Paul. So, you know, that's living out my marriage, um, to Paul is to raise her. And then, um, uh, it, the interesting thing is when Paul first died, I knew that I would feel sad and lonely, but I didn't realize that I would still feel such feelings of love for him or as his book comes out people respond to it I feel proud of him and it's interesting because you know it's nice to be in love and it's nice to feel proud of someone you love and even though he's not here I still have a certain relationship with just thinking about him you know and no matter what happens to me going forward even if I fell in love with somebody else I probably would still love Paul you know, for my whole life. So it's, that's been an interesting lesson. Um, and some of the people who I've met in Kingman have shared their own stories about being a widow or a widower or losing someone in their family. And we've, I've had some conversations about that idea with, um, a number of people in Kingman and that has felt really good too. Yeah. You talk about your decision to have a child when Paul was ill and, of course, you were both working on careers in medicine. There wasn't much time for that, that family thought. I mean, in his busiest weeks, he writes that he was working 100 hours a week. And he, there's this wonderful image that he, you know, would finally finish uh, a surgery. And it was 15 minutes ride home, but he would go and sleep in the parking lot for a few minutes because he wasn't alert enough to drive home. And it's pretty amazing. So these are the sacrifices that he was making. You were making your sacrifices for your career. And he lets us in on this little kind of confidential world saying, you know, you guys were under the stresses of that and you had, you weren't as close as you had been. 
And so then he had this illness and you had to face this, this decision. Would we have a child? Would we do this without him around? That's right, TG. It's funny because um, he does share that in the book that our marriage had become strained um, because of our work lives. And it all actually came to a head just a couple of weeks before he got diagnosed. We kind of got all of that out on the table and we made this real commitment to each other and said, you know, we need to work on our marriage. And then two weeks later, he was diagnosed with metastatic cancer that we knew couldn't be cured. And right. it was just this very intense time. And we realized even more how much we needed each other. And then over the next couple months after that, we talked a lot about, you know, should we have a baby? And he writes this in the book too, but I asked him the question, you know, don't you think that needing to say goodbye to a child will make dying so much more painful? And he said this really kind of astounding thing back. He said, well, wouldn't it be great if it did make it more painful? And he meant, um, you know, having a child is so meaningful that to leave that behind in your life um, it, you know, isn't that a gift to have such a degree of meaning and love? And at the same time, we needed to think about um, my ability to take care of a child and then what her life would be going forward. Um, and she's really thriving. And we have this big family that's very supportive of her and of me. And he had great confidence in me to raise her. And so um, thankfully, I haven't felt alone. And she certainly hasn't felt alone. But that's been our own adjustment, you know, is building a family um, that now doesn't have Paul in it in the same way. I think, well, I think a lot of times, so when I'm working on a radio show, uh, I will listen to this a dozen times before it goes out on the air. And so it's not a half hour show. It's like, I get to spend the day with this person and really kind of soak in what he or she is saying, right? And so now I'm thinking about this book that you're carrying around with you and that you're, you know, helping to promote and talking to people about. And I think about the way, you know, given the changing circumstances in your life, uh, in Katie's life, the way those words resonate differently. And I'm wondering, do you read the book much? Do you look inside of it much? Oh, that's such a good question. Yes, I've read it like probably a thousand times. Really? I mean, I don't know, that's a lot, but <laughs> I read it a lot. And then to prepare for doing interviews about it now, I read through certain portions. Mm. And then uh, the last paragraph of the book is like this beautiful love letter to our daughter. And I have, I didn't even try to memorize it, but I have the whole thing memorized because it's so important to me. Um, and it's funny because it, it does feel like a way to be connected to Paul, right? To spend time with Paul. Um, and and that's something actually that friends and family and um, people in Kingman this weekend have told me to s have said, you know, I, I felt like I could hear his voice in this book. Um, and that's, it's true. Yeah. You, you mentioned at the end of the book, here's a little quote from you. And you say that Paul's voice is strong and distinctive, but also somewhat solitary. Speaking of the voice in the book. And you say, not fully captured in these pages are Paul's sense of humor, he was wickedly funny, or his sweetness and tenderness, the value he placed on relationships with friends and family. And so, you know, as Paul was writing this book, he was really thinking big picture stuff. And he wrote, I had started this career, speaking of medicine, uh, in part to pursue death, to grasp it, to uncloak it, to see it eye to eye, unblinking. And when I read that, I was thinking, how much of that is the weight of his circumstances talking and how much of, so when you think of him as a young med student, was there all that heavy stuff going on with him? Do you remember seeing all that? Yeah, actually I do. It's funny because he, he was kind of a contradictory person. Mm. He was deeply intellectual and he was very interested in um, big philosophical questions and almost in particular, the idea of getting his head around mortality, even as a healthy young person, he was sort of really interested in death as a philosophical and existential problem. Um, and it served him well later, you know, to be able to cope. And he writes about that. But at the same time, he was not serious in a lot of ways. He was really funny. He, he was a real physical comedian. He had a gorilla suit that he kept in the trunk of his car and he said, well, this is my gorilla suit for emergencies only. And he, <laughs> he literally, he was wearing a fake mustache in his medical student ID because um, he worried that medical school would make him too serious. Uh -huh. He was really funny and he, you know, he kind of knew which rules could be broken and he broke them and he, he knew, he was very reverent and irreverent at the same time. Yeah. It was sort of like everything is sacred and nothing is sacred. Right. So he was, he was very, um, serious and very lighthearted at the same time. And 
the more serious version of him comes out in this book, which is why in the epilogue I write, you know, this book doesn't display all of Paul. This is the part he meant to share um, with the world. But um, at the same time, he was just totally hilarious and snuggly. And, um, you know, people in Kingman probably know that uh, yeah. more than other readers of the book because they know him. Paul was very sick when you delivered Katie and he was around for the first few months of her life. He got to share in that. And there's this lovely section in the book, and I wanted to share it. Um, and he says, Day to day, week to week, Katie blossoms. A first grasp, a first smile, a first laugh. Her pediatrician regularly records her growth on charts, tick marks indicating her progress over time. A brightening newness surrounds her. As she sits on my lap, smiling, enthralled by my tuneless singing, and incandescence lights the room. Such a lovely passage and um, such a wonderful presence, it seems, in his life in his last days. It was really wonderful. That does capture it. Um, uh, she was eight months and five days old uh, when Paul died, and they they really were so connected. Um, he loved having a child, and she brought so much um, light and joy uh, into our lives. And she's. it's funny because, you know, she's so central to all of it. You know, she's the center of our lives now. And, um, and she doesn't know anything that's happening. You know, she yeah. doesn't know really that Paul died and she doesn't know about this book. And so this story will be part of where she came from. Um, and it's up to me and our family to help her, you know, understand where she came from. Yeah. And I've seen some of those pictures of, you know, of her on his lap and, and they're just, they're beautiful. They're great. They're so sweet. There's a book trailer on YouTube uh -huh. um, for When Breath Becomes Air, and it's got this little two-minute video um, about the book, but it's it's got a little piece of interview with Paul and these really pretty images of them together smiling at each other. I love it. This is really a special work, and um, I, I'm glad that you're able to share it with us. I'm glad you're able to take the time to talk with me, and I thank you for that. It's been so nice. Thank you so much for talking with me. And that is the program. That's Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to write to me, you can send me an email at foyhradio at gmail.com. That's Focus on Your Health, foyhradio at gmail.com. We'll catch you next time.